Hello, everyone. This is uh, Professor Jeremiah Elioso, and today we're having a new topic. And since the last time we were talking about the food service system, this time around we're going to talk on the unique characteristics of the food service system. So uh, for the food service system, of course, the different types of uh, food service establishments would have different ways and means and processes by which they, they tend to operate their businesses. And we have to understand that considering the nature of their business, they would have different set of characteristics and uniqueness by which they operate. And so let us begin with the first characteristic on the demand for food occurs at peak times around breakfast, lunch, and dinner meals. And between this peak demand times, there are valleys or slow times. So for this one, we have to understand of the peak and valleys of workload. So different restaurants would vary as to the time of the day by which they are busy and the time that they are not so busy. So what does this mean? So we have to understand that the, the operations in, in a restaurant or any type of food service organization would be uh, busy depending on the, the schedule of their operation, such that when um, a restaurant is opening 24-7, chances are that they are working at a full capacity. You really cannot predict that much the, the peaks and valleys of the workload because you're, you're servicing your customers for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and, and meals in between because you're offering or open 24-7. However, for a, a traditional restaurant, which would normally, or say, for example, uh, a restaurant that, that is within uh, the confides of a mall in which it, it opens by 10 in the morning. So normally you're, you would have your staff reporting by 9 a.m. to prep and get ready for the opening of the mall by 10. And naturally the, the first service of the day that they would be offering would be brunch. And maybe the peak of the workload would be during lunchtime. And eventually after the, the peak of the lunchtime, the, the, the workload would, would go down at a valley at around uh, 1.30 or that's past lunchtime. And it will eventually soar up high to its peak around uh, break, break time or that will be uh, three in the afternoon and then it's going to go down again and they may be going to go up for the dinner service. So what does that, this imply? We have to understand that different restaurants would have different peaks and valleys of workloads and that this could be a basis for the management to think of their workforce, to to think of their production because this is going to affect in the way that they work most, especially in the kitchen, that they have to make use of the, the knowledge, skills, and talent of their people to be able to meet of the challenges of most especially during the peak hours. However, during the valley or at the times by which there's a uh, few number of guests, they have to maximize their people by which they could do something on, on that dead time to be able to do something productive. Or maybe they could also consider that it's um, quite the, the, the rest period of their people or the time by which they could take their respective breaks because there's not a lot of people. All right, 
So let us now go to another unique characteristics of the different food service establishments, and that is the demand for food may vary depending on time of the year and the competitive events and the production must be modified accordingly. All right. So uh, we may have observed the times by which the restaurant is at its full swing for a certain time of the year because we are aware that different months call for a certain occasion by which we celebrate. Okay, of course, this varies depending on uh, your your place of origin or country of origin, like say for us here in the Philippines, um, for January, there's not much celebration, but uh, uh, because we usually we would be celebrating um, the, the coming of the year um, in our respective homes, and that comes on the 31st of December. But usually people would go out on January 1 for some um, leisure, all right? And it's still part of the Christmas break because, you know, Filipinos, we would have the longest holidays and we would have it until the, the first week of January. But come February, we would be um, celebrating Valentine's Day and restaurants would be um, serving at full swing capacity because um, because people would would have or will spend their um, precious time with their loved ones at restaurants taking um, dates. So we have to or the food service operations must uh, must have to consider the the amount of people that they have to. Uh, that have to report on that day and that the, the production in the kitchen is also at its maximum, right? And they also have to manage reservations. And then come March would be the graduation season. And of course, uh, and the graduates or the family would be celebrating their this precious uh, time of the year or time of in, in the life of the, the graduates to celebrate with food and naturally family would come together and eat. So, I mean, with all of these, I mean, we have the full 12 months to, I mean, I don't have that much time to discuss, discuss all of those times of the year, but considering of the time of the year and the competitive events there is, the different food service organizations have to um, consider this information to be able to manage their operation. And then the food production and service are labor intensive. All right. Meaning to say that, I mean, whether the oper we're, we're considering the operation in, in the front line or at the back of the house, both are labor intensive in at the back of the house. If you are aware of the, the, the arrangement of, of the kitchen brigade system as designed by George August Escoffier, um, that this is being divided to be able to manage the, the food production line. And um, even in the front line, we know we are aware that um, it could also be labor intensive. There are many things that has to be done. So really taking a course in the hospitality management is no joke and it's no easy feat. All right. And then both skilled and unskilled labor is needed. Of course, um, the different jobs in the hospitality management would entail an entry level position, supervisory position, and then management position. And uh, this different um, ranks in, in, in the organization would require different sets of skills. Okay. And then we also have to note that food is perishable requiring it to be handled properly before, during, and after preparation. And thus, um, a high level of um, program on, on food handling procedure must be adhered always because really food is perishable and that we don't want our customers 
to be suffering from um, food um, food spoilage and um, we don't want any um, bad reports that uh, they are experiencing because they have um, taken food that is uh, really bad. Okay, and then menus change on a daily basis, thus production change daily. But however, this statement is only applicable for a certain type of food service operation, but for a, a traditional restaurant, restaurant, which would have a standing plan, meaning to say that the, the menu does not change very often, then the, the challenge is not as much felt as compared to um, an operation who would be, have to change the menu very frequently, just like with the, the canteen operation. However, sometimes they're using cycle plan or they, they tend to rotate their food on a certain pattern. And that can be quite challenging as well. In addition, these characteristics create challenges in scheduling employees and production and difficulty in staffing and high labor and food costs. Thus, conventional food services systems exhibit these characteristics. When we say conventional, that's the more of the traditional type of food service system, just like how we would have for restaurants and we are aware that working in a restaurant or the restaurant food service operation um, the scheduling of the employees and the production could also be very challenging okay food service directors look for ways to ensure or to reduce or eliminate the impact of these characteristics and alternative food service systems offer solutions and we would actually be discussing that further all right so for example uh, we have what we call the commissary food service systems maybe you have heard of the word commissary but for some who are not aware of this um, a commissary is a centralized uh, food production or sub remote kitchen by which it allows the economies of scale, meaning to say that the cost of the food of production can be reduced because there is a centralized kitchen who prepares most of the food and they are delivering this um, semi-prepared food, half-cooked, um, to remote kitchens or different branches, just like how we would have for Jollibee. And we are very much aware that Jollibee would have numerous um, branches, not only in the Philippines, but all across the globe. And considering this type of food service operations um, to, to ensure of the, the same level of quality of the products that they are offering, they would have a commissary by which um, a central production kitchen prepares most of their food products and they deliver this to remote locations or uh, to, to different branches. And once it arrives at the branches, these are being cooked, all right, and finish on their respective branches or store. Okay. And then we have the ready prepared food service systems. Okay. This are separate production. There's a separate production and service in that food is prepared and stored either frozen or chilled for later re-thermalization and service. So just by merely looking into the word of this type of food service organization, we can note that the food are have already been prepared. So they're just in the storage, maybe on the freezer or on the chiller. And what the restaurants would or the food service operation would have to do is to reheat when there's an order. And with this type of 
food service system, this removes the peaks and valleys of production, just like what I have mentioned a while ago, that occur when production is planned around service. And thus, this is a more cost-effective food service system than the conventional system. We're saying that it's more cost-effective because you're, you do not need that much staff or people to, to prepare the food because it has already been prepared. It's frozen. You just have to reheat it. Okay? So, food service, please note that food service systems may be combined to meet the unique needs of a distinct district school food service operation, meaning to say that we could either combine a conventional type of food service system, a commissary food service system, or a ready prepared system. And uh, later I'll be giving you more example on this different types of food service systems. All right, we're now heading to the flow of food. All right, so that we would have a better understanding on the different types of food service system, although that will be discussed separately to give you a further understanding on that. All right, so it is important to understand the flow of food through a food service system in order to determine the system that will best meet your needs and to develop an effective HACCP program. All right, just by looking into this paradigm, we could infer that different food service organizations would have to go through these different kinds of steps or processes or transformation process by which they undergo. And usually a food service organization would begin with a menu planning, meaning to say that they have to consider, think, and process what are the different types of food items that they can offer, the types of food that is fitted to their respective market or customers based on the demographic profile, psychographic profile to plan based on the occasion, all right? And then after planning, the, the purchaser or the kitchen team, perhaps, is now ready to purchase. And purchasing is the process of buying the right quality and the right quantity of food to at the right time, at the right place, at the right supplier. All right. When the products has already been purchased, the receiving end or the restaurant is now ready to receive, all right? Although there could be some uh, variations when it comes to the receiving process because the, sometimes they order the products to suppliers and uh, they would have to, to receive this on, on the proper schedule and that you have to, on the receiving, you have to, um, it's a challenge for the receiver to whether to accept or reject the product because you have to check if um, the product that, that's being delivered conforms to the quality and quantity standards set forth by the purchaser or that has been ordered by the purchaser. However, when the, the products are deemed acceptable and has met the specifications set, then it's good for storing. And the, the storing can be on, on the dry storage or on the wet storage, meaning to say it's um, some products can be held at a room temperature at the dry storage or on the wet storage, meaning to say either chiller or freezer, depending on the ingredients. Okay. So after that, we're now to head over to the preparation process, meaning to say that there's an order and what you are to do is to miss some plus. 
It's a French word. Maybe you have heard of that. And that means the act of preparation, gathering all of your ingredients, tools, and equipments, and getting ready for the next stage or the next process, which is cooking. Okay? So we are aware that there are many different types of cooking methods and cooking techniques. So it depends on, on the recipe that you are using depends on the order, which method or techniques to follow. All right. After the food being cooked, the food can be held for storage or it can be served directly to the customers. The holding process is an optional stage. Again, we're now um, leading to the variations in the type of operations of the different food service organizations because there are some organizations who cook and prepare food in advance. It's being held for latter use, just like in catering services, okay? Considering the, the bulk of the food that they are preparing, sometimes they are doing this in advance or doing things batch by batch. And uh, some of the food products or food items are uh, prepared in advance and held for later use. Okay. And then the service process is the act of delivering the, the food directly to your guest. Okay. Now, the next step is cooling. All right. Do not be confused of... Uh, of what I have mentioned a while ago because uh, we were talking of serving the food to the guests and now we're, we're on the stage of cooling. Now, uh, do not be confused by the arrow because sometimes let's just go back to the cooking process. Sometimes um, a food service organization may need to um, hold the food uh, for, for storage. Sometimes it can be cooled down for reheating process, okay? So in, in, in the next few slides, we will be discussing further the, the food processing continuum so that you'll have a further understanding of this paradigm. But just to sum it up, um, these are the different stages or processes by which um, a food has to go through or an order has to go through um, before it reaches your target market, all right? So as we talk more about the four types of food service systems, you will find that all of these processes do not apply to all of the systems, all right? So that's what I'm saying, or that's what I'm telling you, that not all of these processes are applicable for all types of food service organizations. Sometimes you would have to skip Sometimes you would have to have combination. Sometimes you have to modify. All right. Also, when the food production is centralized, a transportation transporting process needs to be added. Okay. With a centralized food service system, there will be different processes and critical control points for the central food production facility and the receiving kitchen. So... We can add here on the paradigm um, another box that would um, symbolize the transportation um, process, okay? So maybe after the cooking or it could be after the holding and the cooling um, process by which we could insert or have the delivery stage, all right? So on, uh, on, on this topic of the form of the food purchase, we have to note that or another concept that is important to understand is the form by which the food is purchased. Okay, I'm sure that you all have your experience of buying ingredients and supplies at the market or perhaps the grocery store. And if you have been very observant, you will realize that Food is purchased at different forms, 
different styles, different manner, right? And that can be explained using the diagram of the food processing continuum. So this is the continuum. If you look on the left side of the continuum, you would realize or see that it's the non-end of the continuum, all right? Meaning to say that it is the state by which the ingredients are purchased as almost on its raw and natural state. Meaning to say that there's nothing much has changed from its original form. However, as you go right, okay, there are some changes that is being occurred. And as you go far, farther to the right, you're, you're getting closer to the complete end of the continuum, meaning to say that the, the food is good to go. It's, it could be ready to eat, ready to heat, or ready to serve. All right. However, when you purchase food sometime, somewhat on the middle stage, meaning to say there are some modifications that has been done, there's a lit, just a little maybe cooking, cooking um, that you have to do in, or, in order for you to eat that product. And actually, later, we're going to further discuss that. Okay, so... You have to know that purchasing decisions differ depending on the type of food service system that is in place. Some organizations, some restaurants, some uh, are different food service organizations may have to purchase on the non-end of the continuum. All right, some may buy in the middle, some may buy on the right end or some may use a combination of the different ingredients coming from the different side of the continuum however as we discuss as we are going to discuss on our next topic you will realize of of the uniqueness of each of the different types of food service systems and what are the common um, state of the ingredients that they are purchasing okay so let us have the centralized food production or the commissary. Okay, I have mentioned the characteristic of a commissary a while ago. So considering that a commissary is a centralized kitchen, which delivers food or ingredients to various remote or branch kitchen, uh, we realize that food is more likely to be purchased from the left end of the continuum because of the bulk of the orders because of the number of the kitchens that you service so you you avail of the ingredients on the almost not or on the left side of the continuum with little or no processing at all all right because the processing will be done in the central kitchen Okay, if you try to visualize how the, the commissaries operate, okay, so if Jollibee would service hundreds or thousands of branches all over the Philippines, they would have various commissary units dispersed all over the Philippines to service hundreds or thousands of branches within the area or within the island. And naturally, they would be purchasing um, bulk ingredients almost on its raw state because it is where the, the magic will happen. They will be purchasing tons of vegetables, tons of meat, tons of fruit to be processed, to be converted into a ready-to-eat ready to heat, ready to serve products, which when transported to the various kitchen units or branches, they would just have to have minor cooking, minor processing that has to be done. And usually most of the, the customers of commissary food outlets are uh, fast food restaurants. Because of the nature of fast food, they have to 
uh, really prepare things very quick. It just needs, or the food order just needs minimal cooking process because it has been partially cooked. All right, so that's the uniqueness of the a centralized food production or commissary. Okay. The next one is an assembly serve food service system, which uh, utilizes more on the ingredients on the right end of the continuum. So food is purchased at the complete end of the food processing continuum, and that means that food costs are high, but it's less laborous or less labor is required. So labor cost will decrease. So the best example for this would be the convenience store, okay, like 7-Eleven or mini stop, okay. Uh, maybe you realize that the food at the 7-Eleven stores or mini stop are, the, the food there are quite pricey. And because you're, you're, you're using food on the right end of the continuum and you see that the, the food there are almost ready to eat or it just needs a little reheating using the microwave or you just have to add hot water, all right? And you don't need an expert to do that for you to have a taste of the products of 7-Eleven. You don't need to, to, to have or to hire a chef for you to have a taste of their hot meals, all right, or sandwiches or noodles, all right? So at least we were able to compare the difference of um, a food service organization who's using or adapting um, food ingredients on the uh, non-end of the continuum and a an organization which utilizes to the complete end of the food processing continuum. And actually, that, that, that's the end of our discussion for today. We are going to explore more on the different types of food service system on our next discussion. And we would be able to distinguish the difference of these four types of food service system. So um, this has been Professor Jeremiah Elioso. Do not miss out my recording on our next topic. But if you do um, like this content, please don't forget to hit that uh, thumb up button and please ring those bells to give you an update on uh, my channel. All right, and please subscribe to my channel. All right, so again, I'll see you on our next discussion. All right, thank you very much and you do have a great day. Bye-bye.